and while employed there, he was responsible for the formulation, nutrition information, and ingredient legends on packaging, finding allowable substitute ingredients when needed. He also managed the kosher policy and maintained the kosher records for the company. But he's more than an ice cream expert. He is a resident of Lilydale for almost 40 years. He is a member of the Lilydale Spiritualist Church since 1978. And if I could do math in my head, I would tell you how many years that is. 43, I heard somebody say. Thank you, Spirit. He is serving as our board president. He is a member of the Lilydale Assembly. He is a member of the Lilydale Volunteer Company and has been president of the fire company for the past 22 years. He has also held the offices of chief, assistant chief, and secretary for the fire company. Our speaker is also a member of the Dunkirk Elks Lodge, presently serving as a trustee and having held many offices for the Elks. If you haven't guessed it already, our speaker today is Mr. Bernard Payne. Let's welcome Bernie with Battle Hymn of the Republic. Please stand as able for Battle Hymn of the Republic, which you will find on page 9 of your songbook. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. 
Some of you may have been in yesterday afternoon service, in which case you will be hearing much the same thing that I said yesterday. I could not see any reason why I should make two different talks for two different days on the same weekend, the 4th of July weekend, so happy Independence Day to everyone. When I was asked to speak on July 3rd, and then Susan asked if I would also do the 4th, I said yes. My favorite holiday of the year is Independence Day. And it's not only because of the fact of all the family and friendly picnics that are held on that day, and the fireworks at night, which I love fireworks. I love to get as close to the fireworks as you can so that I can feel the vibration of the boom right in my body as I go on. I, it, it's one of my favorite things to do all year long. And unfortunately, last year, we didn't have that opportunity. Independence Day, to me, is one of the most important days of the year. It's a patriotic day. It's a day that uh, ushered in this great nation. And it's troubling start. In fact, there are many reasons why that revolution in the latter part of the 18th century would have fizzled out and failed. Spirit was there to help us. Spirit was there inspiring many great men at that time to lead a movement that was totally new in the entire world. At that time in the world, everyone was ruled by a king or some other person who claimed that they had divine right to rule and that th whatever they thought was the rule of the day. There was no representative democracy, no freedom for the individuals. People were either part of the aristocracy or perhaps a merchant class, but most were peasants who had very little, if any, control over their lives. <coughs> this was a, a time when there were people here in this country, spirit had ordained that they should be here. People came from all parts of the world to escape oppression, religious intolerance, economic hardships, but here in a wide open country there was opportunities unknown anywhere else. And we have to thank Spirit for that. However, this is a, a good three quarters of a century for the birth of modern spiritualism. But spiritualism and spirit's influence existed from the beginning of time, not just from 1848. It was in 1848, of course, that we recognized spirit and the ability to get messages through our mediums. However, at this point in time, there was one particular man who without his service, there would be no United States of America today. And as much as I would like to claim descent from him, I cannot. But that man is Thomas Paine. Thomas Paine was, he had a hard life growing up. He was, a, he was born into a Quaker family. He tried, uh, his father was a stay maker. Now some, if you read uh, some, uh, biographies of Thomas Paine, they will call him a corset maker. That's not exactly correct. A stay maker made stays, which was a thickly woven rope that was used on the ships of the day. He was not happy in that trade, although he did return to it on at least two other occasions. He tried weaving, he tried being a cobbler, he tried being a tobacconist none of which these trades really satisfied his need. He ended up in an area of London that was at the time called the Gin Mill. It was a place where, uh, where the homeless were of the day, people who had no life that they could live. They mostly were alcoholic, and they solved their problems with gin, hence the name of that area and Thomas Paine fell in exactly into that. 
but he realized that there was more than that to life. So he went back and tried the trades again. He tried the, uh, going on ships. That didn't work. Eventually, a man who was poor, unshaven, shabbily dressed with worn out clothes, went to see a man named Ben Franklin. And Franklin initially was not impressed by him, but as he talked to him, something changed and he saw a future in Thomas Paine. Paine had asked him for a letter of introduction into America, into the colonies. And Franklin granted him a letter written essentially to his nephew in Pennsylvania. When Payne got arrived in America, he was barely alive. He had suffered a sickness on the long journey across the ocean and was nursed back to health very tenuously. And eventually, he went to see Franklin's nephew. Franklin's nephew found him a job as a printer's helper, a printer's apprentice. He also did some tutoring of the children in the day, referred to as a five shilling teacher. Now, I guess that was what they were paid for that. Anyway, he worked for a printer uh, and they who formed a magazine called the Pennsylvania Magazine. He became the magazine's editor. He wrote under his own name and under pseudonyms and also anonymously many of the articles published in that magazine, as well as articles written by other people. Five months after his arrival in the colonies, and the beginnings of a revolution occurred in the colony of Massachusetts. Farmers of that area were being marched upon by the British as Massachusetts had been a problem place for the British for quite some time. There was the Boston Massacre in 1773, the Boston Tea Party, and because of the costs of the French and Indian War, known in Europe as the Seven Years' War, the British had expected the colonies to put their fair share of the cost of that war. In doing so, they had added various taxes and excises on all of the imports being brought into the colonies. They also put on uh, restrictions on any exports that the colonies could have. Now, shipping was the, one of the main livelihoods of people in the Massachusetts colony and the other New England colonies. So the British had attempted to suppress any further rebellion, so they marched on the farmers. Now, one of the things that made America such a great place, the American colonies, is that it was wide open. Everyone that was in the colonies pretty much was armed and British knew this, so they're marching on the villages of Lexington and Concord to confiscate arms of the farmers. The farmers had resisted, and at some point, no one knows who, someone fired the shot. That shot is what we've been historically taught was a shot for around the world. It started a revolution, and it would have gotten no further than that would have fizzled out as only the farmers in rebellion against the British in New England. If it hadn't been for Thomas Paine, he was keep, uh, listening to all of the stories coming down out of New England. He realized that there were some people in Pennsylvania that were forming a militia, and he realized also that it was pretty much a losing cause. How could a bunch of farmers who were not trained as military people possibly fight against the greatest military force in the world at that time. However, over the course of the next several months, he formulated in his mind a book that he was going to write. He had it finished in the late fall, early winter of 1775. He went to his publisher, the publisher of the Pennsylvania Magazine, 
who read the, uh, uh, the book and said, I will not print that. That is treason. And absolutely refused. So they found another printer who said, yes, he would. And they, in appreciation for it and also to encourage the printing of many copies, of which the initial printing was only about 2,000. He told the printer that he could have all the profits from it. He did not want any royalties. That book, as many of you may have known or guessed, was entitled Common Sense. And it was written, Common Sense, written by an Englishman. He did not even put his name on it. But it was not long before people who knew who he was. If that book, in the population of the time of about 3 million people throughout the entire 13 colonies was either read by or read to nearly every one of that population. Not everyone was in favor of, uh, of what he said. Many thought it was treason. Cain had no love for kings, and especially none for George III, who he responded to and referred to very disrespectfully for the time in his book. That book inspired people to come together. They, at that point, Tom, uh, John Adams in the Continental Congress did suggest claim, declaring independence from Great Britain. However, it came upon the rest as not a good idea. When Common Sense came out, it awakened the whole populace. And as you know, in July of 1776, the Declaration of Independence was passed by the Continental Congress and signed by the Congress and sent off to King George. It was in that time that people actually felt that they had a chance to change their lives. There was much opportunity in the American colonies. And these people were inspired by Thomas Paine's book, Common Sense. It was read to people out around the campfires. It was read to the uh, various volunteers joining the army. It was Washington asked uh, Thomas Paine to read it. Paine joined the army and the military at the time. He marched with them, got to know the soldiers, got to know the volunteers, and realized that it was a very difficult possibility to win. He then wrote what was known as the crisis papers. The first one begins with, these are the times that try men's souls. And that phrase occurred to him many, many times in his life. It was these papers that inspired the patriots of the day to continue their fight, even though they, any time they engaged the British Army, it was a losing cause. It wasn't until three years into the war that they actually had any decent chance of engaging the British. The only thing that they could do was try to not get caught and, and, and try to disorganize the British. It turned out to be successful, of course, as we are here today. Cain began to think of himself not as a stay maker or as any sort of mercantile person. He began to think of himself as a revolutionist. He thought of himself as a citizen of the world, not a citizen of the colonies or of Great Britain or of any other country, that he was a citizen of the world and the entire world was his village. He served the Continental Congress as a Secretary of Finance to get financial aid to Washington's army. When the French had given guns, powder, shoes, clothing, all the kind of things that were needed for the Army. There was a group in Philadelphia who figured they could make a profit off of this. It was they who found this and actually brought them up with charges and got the, the 
the needs that the French provided to the army and to the uh, people who needed it without undue extra cost. This did, of course, maintain some enemies for the rest of his life. <coughs> after the revolution and after independence was secured, Payne was given some land in Pennsylvania and in New Rochelle, New York, but he felt that his job in America was done at that point. He returned to Great Britain. He wrote some articles there which were published, trying to incite the British peasant class and merchant class to uprise and overthrow the monarchy and the aristocracy in Great Britain. Great Britain, of course, had, had a history of revolution in their own right, but most of the revolution's consequences only tended to empower the aristocracy against the king. It did nothing for the lower classes. That was Payne's attempt was to incite a revolution. It did incite some, however, Great Britain was not the American colonies. It is difficult to start a revolution when you don't have the arms to do so. Consequently, his attempt at a revolution fizzled. A few years later came the French Revolution, the storming of the Bastille, which anniversary will be 10 days from now. At any rate, Edmund Burke, who was a champion in Parliament for the American cause, wrote a series of articles condemning the French Revolution. Payne read these articles and disagreed with them wholeheartedly. He then wrote a book that he titled The Rights of Man, in which he contested all of the points that Burke had brought about in his writing. As he did get the book published, and as a result, it was deemed as treason in Great Britain. Payne had a warrant out for his arrest, and he knew that, when, that the penalty for treason would be hanging. He left for, he was encouraged by many of his friends to leave Great Britain. He headed for the port of Dover, and because the warrant was delayed, again, probably because of spirit inter intervention, he was able to leave England before being arrested. He arrived in France, in Calais. He was hailed there as a hero. People had known about him, and they welcomed him. He was elected a representative to the National <coughs> Assembly by the citizens of Calais. He took his seat there. He wanted the revolution to succeed. He wanted it to be a popular revolution. He believed that with the success in America and a successful revolution in France, Britain would be next, and eventually the entire world would know the freedom of everyone and not be under the <coughs> dictates of a king or an aristocracy. As part of his time in the National Assembly, there was a motion brought forth as to decide what to do with King Louis the Sixteenth. He had been, he had abdicated, he was in custody at that point in time, he had been arrested, and the question was, should he be kept imprisoned until after the revolution and then exiled, exiled immediately, or executed? Payne's argument was that he should eventually be exiled to the United States. However, his point of view and the people that were with him were in the minority. It was passed by the assembly to have the king executed by guillotine. Eventually, this was his stand in favor of saving the king's life was deemed treason to the French Revolution. He was arrested, and he, along with many of his friends, he witnessed his friends going to the guillotine 
knew that his turn was coming. He was uh, held in a place called the Luxembourg, which was a palace turned into a prison. While he was in prison, to occupy his time and also to conclude an aspiration that he had for many times, he wrote a book. Actually, it was written in two parts. He wrote the first part of a book called The Age of Reason. Now, I don't know how many of you know about The Age of Reason. It was a very big inspiration of the time. It was his argument against the organized and the orthodox religious teachings of the day. Paine was a deist, as were many of the revolutionary, revolutionary leaders in America. He strongly believed in God. He did not necessarily accept the way organized religion controlled people and forced them to do what they thought was right. <clears throat> Writing this, brought him many enemies, but he, he knew this would happen and he was pretty sure that he would not survive the French Revolution. In fact, Spirit was there again to save his life, which it had done many times in America and in Britain where there were attempts of assassination and either the weapon failed to fire or whoever was shooting it missed their target. At any rate, Payne had been spared several times, and I can't think of any other reason than the fact that Spirit was there and wanted him to survive and continue his work. While he was in prison, again, he fell into serious sickness, going in and out of fever. He really did not expect to survive that. During that time, he was selected to be taking his turn at the guillotine. A mark was made on his door. However, since a doctor was visiting him at the time, the mark was made on the inside of the door rather than the outside. So, when they came to select the people that were supposed to be meeting their fate, they passed by Thomas. Shortly thereafter, the reign of terror ended and he was released from prison. He had asked for, he had sent a letter and asked for uh, it stuff to be given to Washington and that he be free and allowed to return. However, the ambassador to France at the time was one of the people involved in the attempt to make extra money off the imports from France during the revolution and was no friend of Payne's, so did not do anything to try to help him. It wasn't until James Monroe became ambassador that eventually he got results. He was reinstated in the National Assembly and he took his place there and still tried to recover the revolution for the common man. However, Bonaparte came to power at the time and Napoleon wished to have Payne on his committee help him incite a revolution and an invasion of England, which Payne said was not possible. At any rate, he returned to the United States in around 1803-1804. He took up residence at the farm in Pennsylvania, decided that was not for him, went to New Rochelle. But upon his first arrival, he went to the White House to visit his old friend Thomas Jefferson. He was hoping that Jefferson would appoint him to some uh, position in his government, a minor cabinet post, even something less important than that. However, because of the writings of the Age of Reason, Tom became one of the most hated people in the colonies. They forgot what he had done to them for the revolution. He suffered all kinds of insults. Eventually, he, he became ill. He had a couple of strokes. He died in New Rochelle, New York in 1809. As a result of 
of that, his funeral, which took place in New Rochelle, was attended by only seven people. Three of them were people that he had known in France, who he had lived with. Three of them were three African Americans and one preacher who offered last rites at a, a funeral for Thomas Paine. He was given a grave on his property, a stone was made, and the stone with an epitaph of, he made common sense. That was the epitaph. His stone was broken up. The, the flowers and trees and shrubbery passed around it were all ripped up. Eventually, his bones were dug up and, and sent to England, where someone thought that they could make a profit by selling parts of his bones. Most of his remains have been lost. However, eventually, a organization called the New Rochelle National Historical Museum attempted to recover his bones and gave him a proper burial. Perhaps it is fitting, though, that only a few pieces were left that were believed to belong to Thomas Maine. Perhaps it is best that his remains be lost into a world that he considered himself a citizen, the village that was his home. We owe a great debt to, to Thomas Paine, and today is a great day to remember him. It is also a great day for everyone to look over and read the Declaration of Independence. Have a happy Independence Day now. Thank you.